Welcome to the Church of the Ascension. I believe it's at this moment that the kids are going to go off to Sunday school. And they'll be coming back shortly. After all the slow and boring stuff is over. See you later. See you later. Okay. <laughs> And we will begin with the penitential order, um, which will include the Decalogue, which you can um, pray uh, standing, kneeling, or sitting as you are capable. Blessed be the Lord who forgives all our sins. His mercy endures forever. Hear the commandments of God to his people. I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of bondage. You shall have no other gods but me. I am the Lord, have mercy. You shall not make for yourself any idol. I am the Lord, have mercy. You shall not invoke with malice the name of the Lord, your God. I am the Lord, have mercy. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother. Amen. Lord have mercy. You shall not commit murder. Amen. Lord have mercy. You shall not commit adultery. Amen. Lord have mercy. You shall not steal. Amen. Lord have mercy. You shall not be a false witness. Amen. Lord have mercy. You shall not covet anything that belongs to your neighbor. Jesus said, the first commandment is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of our Savior Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. Son Jesus Christ, 
came down from heaven to be the true bread which gives life to the world. Evermore give us this bread that he may live in us and we in him who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. A reading from 1 Samuel. The Lord said to Samuel, How long are you going to grieve over Saul? I have rejected him as king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and get going. I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem because I have found my next king among his sons. How can I do that? Samuel asked. When Saul hears of it, he'll kill me. Take a heifer with you, the Lord replied, and say, I have come to make a sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will make clear to you what you should do. You will anoint for me the person I point out to you. Samuel did what the Lord instructed. When he came to Bethlehem, the city elders came to meet him. They were shaking with fear. Do you come in peace, they asked. Yes, Samuel answered. I have come to make a sacrifice to the Lord. Now make yourselves holy, and then come to me with, with the sacrifice. Samuel made Jesse and his sons holy and invited them to the sacrifice as well. When they arrived, Samuel looked at Elab and thought, that must be the Lord's anointed right in front. But the Lord said to Samuel, have no regard for his appearance or stature, because I haven't selected him. God doesn't look at things like humans do. Humans see what is, only what is visible to the eyes, but the Lord sees into the heart. Next, Jesse called for Abinadab, who presented himself to Samuel, but he said, the Lord hasn't chosen this one either. So Jesse presented Shama, but Samuel said, no, the Lord hasn't chosen this one. Jesse presented seven of his sons to Samuel, but Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord hasn't picked any of these. Then Samuel asked Jesse, is that all of your boys? They're still the youngest one, Jesse answered, but he's out keeping the sheep. Send for him, Samuel told Jesse, because we can't proceed until he gets here. So Jesse sent and brought him in. He was reddish brown, had beautiful eyes, and was good looking. The Lord said, that's the one, go anoint him. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him right there in front of his brothers. The Lord's spirit came over David from that point forward. Then Samuel left and went to Ramah. The word of the Lord. We will recite Psalm 23, responsibly whole verse by whole verse. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He blesses the rest in the meadows. He leads me to the restful waters. He keeps me alive. He guides me in proper paths for the sake of his good name. You know when I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no danger, but the Lord with me. The rod and the staff that they protect me. You set a table for me right in front of my enemies. You bathe my head in oil. My cup is so full it spills over. A reading from Ephesians. You were once in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. So live your life as children of light. Light produces fruit that consists of every sort of goodness, justice, and truth. Therefore, test everything to see what's pleasing to the Lord, and don't participate in the unfruitful actions of darkness. Instead, you should reveal the truth about them. It's embarrassing to even talk about what certain persons do in secret. 
But everything exposed to the light is revealed by the light. Everything that is revealed by the light is light. Therefore it says, wake up sleeper, get up from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. According to St. John. Glory to you, you, Lord Christ. As Jesus walked along, he saw a man who was blind from birth. Jesus' disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned so that he who was born blind, this man or his parents? Jesus answered, Neither he nor his parents. This happened so that God's mighty works might be displayed in him. While it's daytime, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming, when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After he said this, he spit on the ground, made mud with his saliva, and smeared the mud on the man's eyes. Jesus said to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went away and washed. When he returned, he could see. The man's neighbors and those who used to see him when he was a beggar said, isn't this the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, it is. And others said, no, it's someone who looks like him. 
But the man said, yes, it's me. So they asked him, how are you now able to see? He answered, the man they called Jesus made mud, smeared it on my eyes and said, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. They asked, where is this man? He replied, I don't know. Then they led the man who had been born blind to the Pharisees. Now Jesus made the mud and smeared it on the man's eyes on a Sabbath day. So the Pharisees asked him how he was able to see. The man told them, he put mud on my eyes, I washed, and now I see. Some Pharisees said, this man isn't from God because he breaks the Sabbath law. Others said, how can a sinner do miraculous signs like these? So they were divided. Some of the Pharisees questioned the man who had been born blind again. What do you have to say about him since he healed your eyes? He replied, he's a prophet? The Jewish leaders didn't believe the man had been born blind and received his sight until they called for his parents. The Jewish leaders asked them, is this your son? Are you saying he was born blind? How can he see? His parents answered, we know he is our son. We know he was born blind, but we don't know how he sees now. And we don't know who healed his eyes. Ask him. He's old enough to speak for himself. His parents said this because they feared the Jewish authorities. This is because the Jewish authorities had already decided that whoever confessed Jesus to be the Christ would be expelled from the synagogue. That's why his parents said, he's old enough, ask him. Therefore, they called a second time for the man who had been born blind and said to him, give glory to God, we know this man is a sinner. The man answered, I don't know whether he's a sinner. Here's what I do know. I was blind and now I see. They questioned him. What did he do to you? How did he heal your eyes? He replied, I already told you and you didn't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? They insulted him. You are his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spoke to Moses, but we don't know where this man is from. The man answered, this is incredible. You don't know where he is from, yet he healed my eyes. We know that God doesn't listen to sinners. God listens to anyone who is devout and does God's will. No one has ever heard of a healing of the eyes of someone born blind. If this man wasn't from God, he couldn't do this. They responded, you were born completely in sin. How is it that you dare to teach us? Then they expelled him. Jesus heard that they had expelled the man born blind. Finally, or excuse me, finding him, Jesus said, Do you believe in the human one? He answered, Who is he, sir? I want to believe in him. Jesus said, You have seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking to you. The man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped Jesus. Jesus said, I have come into the world to exercise judgment so that those who don't see can see and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard what he said and asked, surely we aren't blind, are we? Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you wouldn't have any sin. But now that you say we see, your sin remains. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Several years ago, 
I clipped an article out of the New York Times, and it was entitled, Pole Dancing with a Difference. Did you hear that? Pole Dancing for, as, with a Difference. And if you don't know what pole, anybody here not know what pole dancing is? <laughs> I'm just trying to see what you are like. <laughs> In case you don't, or too embarrassed to raise your hand, it's a characteristic form of exotic dancing, sometimes done in strip clubs. Your imagination can take it from there. And this is the this is the piece of the article, or the, some of the article that I want to read to you. The dance moves, once reserved for strip clubs, are being embraced by devout church-going women and taught to them by one Crystal Deans, a former stripper who offers free pole dancing classes at Best Shape of Your Life, which is her fitness studio. Pole dancing for Jesus has attracted some nationwide attention, as you can imagine. But why? Let's let Mrs. Deans explain. She says, I had a child at a very young age. I got pregnant at 14. It was a huge struggle, but I managed to finish high school and even a little college. I began stripping at age 18 because the money was just too good. Six and a half years ago, now, my marriage was in trouble. Something came into my head and said, you need God, you need Jesus, you need a church. My great aunt directed me to one, and one Sunday I went to church all by myself. I came home and said to my husband, I'm starting marriage counseling on Wednesday. He came with me, and I stopped stripping. Today our marriage is strong, and I own this business. This class has helped a lot of people. It's helped people with weight issues. It's helped people spice up their marriages. It's done a lot of good things. Even though a lot of people are going to judge it or say nasty things about me, if I can help one person look at what I've been through and where I am today, if it gives them a little hope, then I have done what I am here to do. I think it's safe to say that in American culture today, Jesus is enlisted as a marketing tool in umpty million ways. There are, of course, slick televangelists. There are prosperity gospel hucksters, NASCAR drivers, football players, and football coaches, coaches of salesmen, not to mention good old-fashioned politicians, will spout platitudes and preachments and prayers, bestowing or beseeching Jesus' blessing on things I cannot believe Jesus would be caught dead having anything to do with. It makes me crazy. But then I remember the sons of Moses. That's an actually more a literal translation of the, 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 the words in here that say disciples of Moses. It's literally sons of Moses. I remember those sons of Moses, those experts in the law who so sharply questioned the once blind man in today's gospel. They hear the remarkable news that a man long known in the city as a beggar, a blind man who sat at the temple gates and begged for alms, whose kitchen, whose condition could only be explained as a punishment for somebody's sins, this man is now walking around able to see. And they quickly determined that Jesus, a perceived challenger to the traditional religious system, they perceived that Jesus is behind this. The Pharisees questioned Jesus by um, questioning the once bland, blind man and his parents. The parents are cowed into silence, but the man with the new sight simply cannot fathom the leader's stubborn refusal to welcome the miracle that simply stands before them. The Pharisees want to quibble over Sabbath-keeping regulations, 
And where Jesus gets the authority to do these kinds of things? The man born blind simply wants to celebrate a miracle. I recognize myself in those Pharisees. Can you recognize yourself in them? My sense of decorum and good taste, my reverence for tradition, my desire to be reasonable and rational, all these things, not bad in themselves, mind you, but they can make me blind to the surprising ways God's mercy bursts forth among unexpected people and events. The remarkable thing we see in this gospel this morning that we see over and over again in the Gospels is the propensity of Jesus, the propensity of God, to reveal himself in the midst of people and in places where we, good religious folks, can't imagine him being. But with a Samaritan woman last week, a blind beggar today, with tax collectors and prostitutes and sinners and lepers on every page of the Gospels, Jesus' capacity to respond to people simply will not be bound by our attempts to hedge it in. Among, one of the, many, among the many sources, uh, uh, podcasts and written stuff uh, that I use weekly to prepare for preaching, there have been a lot of references in this past week to that good old hymn. Oh, sure, I should have called you and said, let's put that in, but I forgot to. Sorry. Um, good old hymn, Amazing Grace. A lot of responses among preachers to that. No surprise, the very first verse of that hymn pings off the declaration of the beggar in the gospel story today. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found was blind, but now I see. And of course, most of you probably know the origin story of that old hymn. It's pretty familiar. It was written by a man named John Newton. He wrote the poem, the music is other people. But John Newton originally wrote it under the title, Faith's Review and Expectation. Those Victorian people knew how to name a tune, didn't they? <laughs> Faith's review and expectation. Faith's review, it didn't work. Um, <laughs> but he was a slave ship captain. And he had a conversion experience and eventually became an evangelical Anglican priest. Late in life, he penned a poem for which he is immortalized and which we sing all the time. To this day, you can read on his tombstone in the town of Olney in England, this epitaph. John Newton, clerk, once an infidel and libertine, a servant of slavers in Africa, was by the rich mercy of our Lord Jesus and Savior Jesus Christ, preserved, restored, pardoned, and appointed to preach the faith he had long labored to destroy. That's the well-known part of the story. The less well-known part of the story is that Newton's conversion experience and his abandonment of slave trading were not simultaneous. In fact, John Newton continued to sail slave ships for nearly a decade after his conversion experience until a stroke, not his conscience, but a stroke stopped him from doing that. And for the next 25 or 30 years, he continued to invest his fortune in the slave trade before finally, near the end of his life, renouncing the institution of slavery and repenting of his part in it. Makes it a slightly less fabulous story, doesn't it? Well, at the end of today's gospel, Jesus says something rather remarkable. I came into this world for judgment so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. The simple fact of the matter is, 
all of us, every single one of us, are blind in some way or another. Our prejudices, our life's grievances and wounds, our insecurities, even good things like our educations, all conspire to blind us to what might be sitting right in front of us. Like those Pharisees who confronted Jesus, we tend to think we see just fine. We see the sin and silliness in other folks with crystal clarity, don't we? While our own lives remain largely unexamined and unquestioned. We all need Jesus to spit on the ground and make some mud. I've always loved that image. <laughs> Smear. Such a pretty image. We all need to be a little less sure we know who Jesus is and what Jesus wants and a little more humble in trying to see clearly. And we need especially to avoid that Pharisaic trap of looking down on blind beggars or slave traders or hucksters or pole dancers or any other kind of sinner person and assume that they can't possibly be the objects of God's passionate love because they are. They so very much are. I love the Old Testament lesson today. It's great. We learn that Samuel is going to come and find out, try to find out who God's new chosen anointed person is to be the king of Israel. And he goes through six of Jesse's sons, all of them pretty handsome, pretty strong, pretty smart, all of them looking like a good king to Samuel, but none of them are the guy. And Samuel says to Jesse, anybody else here? He said, well, I do have one more little runt of a son. He's out in the fields keeping the sheep. Nasty work keeping the sheep. And Samuel says, we can't go on until you bring him here. When David comes into the room, Samuel sees that this is one. This is the one. Yeah, he's also good looking. He's ruddy. <laughs> he's ruddy and good looking. Got curly hair. Gorgeous guy. But... That's not what God sees. God sees what? The heart. And we know later on that David will prove to be a very mixed bag of a leader. But one thing that never stopped was his capacity and desire to be in communion with his God. And that's what God could use. Not his strength, not his good looks, not his intelligence, not all that other stuff that we value. But that heart that could be broken enough and loving enough to write a 23rd Psalm. Sometimes God lifts our blindness in a moment, like that blind man in today's gospel. Sometimes, like with John Newton, it takes God's decades to clear our sight. Most often it will be more like Crystal Dean's experience. We gain our sight a bit at a time and in some sometimes rather strange ways. But in this Lenten season, we are invited and called to pray for God to cleanse the eyes of our hearts and souls, to be willing to see ourselves and as importantly, to see others and to see the world a little bit the way God sees it. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saves a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found blind. And I'm trying so very hard to see. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us stand and pray together the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. 
We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead the life of the world will come out. With all our heart and with all our mind, let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the world, for the welfare of the Holy Church of God, and for the unity of all peoples, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have for Michael, our presiding bishop, for Mark, our bishop, Anne, our bishop coadjutor elect, Vincent, our priest, Clark, our intern, and for all the clergy and people, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For our president, for the leaders of the nations, and for all in authority, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For this city, for every city and community, and for those who live in them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the good earth which God has given us, and for the wisdom and will to conserve it, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the aged and infirm, for the widowed and orphans, and for the sick and the suffering, especially Jean, Beth, Mike, Teddy, Jay, Julie, Anne Marie, Mary Ann, uh, Marcus, Spencer, Ella Jane, Martha, Amanda, Pamela, Jennifer, Linda, Marilyn, Suzanne, Tina, John, Mary Beth, Gil, Rebecca, Gary, David, Ray, Andrea, Wendy, Corky, Tim, and Bill and those we know in the military, McDowell, Sydney, Jason, and Brendan. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord mercy. For the poor and the oppressed, for the unemployed and the destitute, for prisoners and captives, and for all who remember and care for them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord mercy. For all who have died in the hope of the resurrection, and for all the departed, especially Ermintrude, John, Jennifer, Pat, Dolores, Doris, Bob, and Rick. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For deliverance from danger, violence, oppression, and degradation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. That we may end our lives in faith and hope, without suffering and without reproach, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. In the communion of saints, let us commend ourselves and one another and all our life to Christ our God. Amen. Almighty and eternal God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The sisters and brothers, the peace of the Lord be always with you. Good morning. You know, I just love, I just had this strange thought. 
You know, back in the 1960s, this meant you were a militant. <laughs> now it means peace be with you. Cool. Um, you never know how that stuff's going to happen. Uh, are there announcements other than one, the ones that are very clearly written in the back of your bulletins? A lot of them growing up. You've got Holy Week things starting to show up over here in the sign-up sheets. Um, and R Rita, are you raising your hand to make an announcement? Could you make it very loud? That's not very loud. That's not very loud. That's good. Now scream. There we go. Too late. Well, Sunday, so let me get a while. John Miller for sure. And also, um, I have flyers. If anybody wants to take them and hand them out, uh, hang them in their buildings, hand them out to friends this evening. Okay? Thank you. Anything else? Yes. Today, the um, afternoon guild is going to play Playhouse to see Ada and the train. And there are some tickets that were not taken, and I would be glad if anybody would like to come and take them for free. It's at 2 o'clock, and then following that, if you would like to join us, I'm sure I can make arrangements. We're heading over to Berkeley Tavern um, for um, early dinner. So just see me if you would like the tickets. I'll have them, and I'd be happy to share them with you. Let us walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God.
be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You bid your faithful people cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast. That fervent in prayer and in works of mercy and renewed by your word and sacraments, they may come to the fullness of grace which you have prepared for those who love you. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Said Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people, the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever.
Take them in the remembrance that Christ died for you. Feed on him in your hearts by faith and with thanksgiving. In union, O Lord, with your faithful people at every altar of your church, where the Holy Eucharist is now being celebrated, I desire to offer to you praise and thanksgiving. I remember your death, Lord Christ. I proclaim your resurrection. I await your coming in glory. Since I cannot receive you today in the sacrament of your body and blood, I beseech you to come spiritually into my heart. Cleanse and strengthen me with your grace, Lord Jesus, and let me never be separated from you. May I live in you and you in me, in this life and in the life to come. Amen.
we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us of these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, we honor and glory now and forever. Amen. Let us bow down before the Lord. Look down in mercy, O Lord, on your people who bow before you, and grant that those whom you have nourished by your word and sacraments may bring forth fruit worthy of repentance through Christ our Lord. Amen. <laughs> Thanks be to God. God.